Okay, so here we're going to look at two different models for the spread of disease um, based on certain assumptions. So the assumption in the first model seems plausible is that the rate of change in, in how much of the population is infected, right? So the rate at which the proportion of people um, infected is changing. Um, that rate of change should be proportional to how many are currently infected, right? So you need sick people to spread the disease. And so the more people that are sick, the more likely it is that they're going to infect other people. Okay, well, this makes sense initially, but then you realize that, well, what, what we have here is that the, the rate and change in that proportion, right, it's some multiple of the current proportion, um, which means that as a function of t, right, the proportion of the population that's infected, or the percentage, if you want to think of it that way, the percentage infected, um, well, we know what this looks like, right? It looks like an initial proportion times e to the kt, right? This is our exponential growth model. Um, but this is problematic because exponential growth is, well, exponential, right? It's not bounded. It goes on forever. Um, but a proportion is not allowed to exceed 1, right? A proportion is some number between 0 and 1, right? Just like a percentage is between 0 and 100, right? You just multiply by 100 to get from proportion to percentage. Um, so it's not a very physical model. I mean, for initial spread, it might be useful. So as, as the disease begins to spread, you have an initial proportion that's infected, and you want to see what's going on for the um, first phase of the, uh, of the spread. Maybe it, maybe it works. But certainly doesn't work for long-run behavior, right? Um, for large values of t, this makes no sense. So we could look at a different model. We say, okay, well, you know, one of the things that we, we, we didn't take into account in this model is that um, eventually everyone is infected. Well, I mean, we know that doesn't happen, right? Some people are going to be immune or some people will avoid the infection. But um, if everyone is infected, there's nobody left to infect and, and this the rate of change should go to zero, right? Once you hit 100% infection rate, there's nobody left to infect. Um, so then we say, well, maybe, maybe the right model is to say that the rate of change should be proportional not to how many are currently infected, but how many are not infected, right? And so we say, well, what does that look like? Well, now we have something that looks like dp dt. Now it's going to be multiple of the proportion not infected. So if p is the proportion infected, well, 1 minus p would be the proportion that's not infected, right? Because infected plus not infected adds up to 1 total population. Well, this is essentially Newton's law of cooling now, right? Um, we, we know how to solve this. We know that this looks like p of t is, so, you know, before we had like an A for the ambient temperature, now we just have 1, right? 1 minus some constant value, E to the minus KT. We had something like that. Um, and this maybe works a little bit better, at least uh, in the long run, um, right? If T goes to infinity, the proportion infected is going to approach 1, right? Because that's going to go to 0. Um, and, and it certainly never exceeds 1. Okay, so that seems to work, although it still doesn't account for things like maybe some people get sick and then they recover and they're no longer infected and they're not going to get infected again. Some people will avoid the disease in the first place, um, right? So we, we certainly don't actually expect that the proportion hits one, right? Um, we don't usually have a disease that hits 100% of the population. It's going to level off at some point. Um, but at least it makes more sense than the model we had here, right? It's, it's a little bit better. Um, best case scenario probably takes into account both of them, right? We say, well, what about, you know, does this one, does it work well for initial behavior, right? Maybe not. Maybe this one is better for sort of small values of t. Maybe this is better for large values of t. Um, maybe neither one of them is really all that great, and we should look for a third model that, uh, that 
deals with some of the flaws that are present in these ones. Of course, um, modeling infectious diseases is a lot more complicated than, than what we can do with the simple differential equations that we see um, in, in a calculus course. Um, but it gives you some idea of, of the starting points that people might use when they actually do this sort of thing for a living.